everyone, welcome to the AI Canvas, the podcast that explores the impact of generative AI on businesses, the arts, and our everyday lives. I'm your host, David Foster, co-founder of Applied Data Science Partners and author of the book, Generative Deep Learning, Teaching Machines to Paint, Write, Compose, and Play. Now, over the coming weeks, we'll be diving deep into fascinating conversations with a diverse range of thought leaders, including musicians, artists, journalists, educators, marketers, lawyers, and those at the cutting edge of this fascinating field. We'll explore their unique insights into the opportunities and potential threats of deploying this technology across industries and how it's going to reshape our world. We have a fascinating conversation ahead of us, so sit back, relax, and let's dive into the world of generative AI right here on the AI Canvas. Welcome back to another episode of the AI Canvas, the podcast where we discuss the applications of generative AI on business, the arts, and society. Now, I'm absolutely thrilled to have with me today Matt Harvey, who joins us as an expert in IP law, and specifically the application of AI and where this might lead. Um, so Matt joins us from Gowling WLG. He's head of uh, their Artificial Intelligence Law Division. Matt is a titan of all things AI, and he is an expert in their crossover with the legal implications. Matt's been recognized for his trailblazing work in AI and the law, and he's got a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the intersection of AI and intellectual property. Whether it's about interventions generated by AI, enforcement of AI-related IP, or the cross-border use of data, and trained models, Matt has got the scoop. So I can't wait to dive into those topics with him on this podcast. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back and enjoy on the AI Canvas. So Matt, welcome to the podcast. Uh, great to have you here. Thank you for having me. So I wanna start, uh, I'm sure our listeners will be really interested to hear at a high level, what are the major topics on the minds of IP lawyers? Because you know we hear a lot about copyright and infringement but I wonder if you could just give us a summary of what you see to be the big issues at the moment with AI and IP law. Sure, I think it's changed in the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. So I would say before that, the real game in town was uh, the use of AI for, let's say, drug discovery or drug targets. So very specific models for very narrow domains. And the big concerns there were whether you could patent mm -hmm. uh, the new technology, whether you could patent the discoveries mm -hmm. of those technologies and then how you do a commercial deal. Because typically you'd be in a collaboration with another entity, maybe a data supplier, maybe a data scientist, maybe a platform for sure. the AI. And people were very concerned about the sharing of data and who would end up owning the improvements mm. to the model. So we've been dealing with that for a number of years. But the new game in town with generative AI is that AI models are being trained essentially on the entire internet mm -hmm. and on vast reams of copyright works. And this has created intense interest and indeed ongoing litigation mm -hmm. as to whether it is an infringement to train these models mm -hmm. on copyright works and also far more interest in whether there is copyright in the outputs mm -hmm. and you can exploit and protect the outputs. I see, so there's almost these two sides of the equation. There's what's being used to feed these models and whether there's infringement there, but also what can you actually do with this once it's spat out a generated piece of art or a generated piece of music or whatever it might be. Is that in itself something that can be copyrighted? Exactly. Um, so let's maybe take those two sides of the equation independently. So let's talk about the inputs and mm -hmm. what, this, what these models have been trained on. Um, you know, we hear a lot about in the news about you know, the likes of Getty suing um, Stability AI and, um, uh, and the, the ability for these companies to sort of say, well, you know, it's fair use. Um, I wonder if you can just take us through what fair use means and, and why they're sort of claiming that what they've done here is, um, is, is, is reasonable. Sure. I think, first of all, let's put it in context. So a lot of this work has come out of academia mm -hmm. and there may be broader exceptions to copyright where you're doing something non-commercial. Mm. The other important context is a lot of the mindset has come from the US. And it's very important to realize that copyright law and the exceptions to copyright law are not harmonized. Mm. And it is possible that the US has a far more generous exception mm -hmm. to copyright infringement than some other jurisdictions. So to take them in turn, in the US you have the concept of fair use. And what a lawyer would tell you is the statute there, the Copyright Act there, has an open-ended list. Mm -hmm. So a court 
can decide that something, some new activity that isn't specified in their law mm -hmm. is actually an exception to copyright. And a classic example is internet search. Mm -hmm. So there's a famous case in the States called Perfect 10, where search engines were crawling uh, third-party websites, processing third-party copyright works, and then producing them in search results. Mm -hmm. Now, on any normal application of copyright law, those are copies and mm -hmm. those are infringements, but they decided that that was within fair use because they were enabling an entirely new technological um, service mm -hmm. for search engine. And so in America there's this concept of transformatory use. Right, yeah. All of this is subject to fairness, mm. so part of that was they weren't competing, they were merely allowing users to find the content and then go actually to the website. Right, okay, so it might actually be beneficial in some ways to the owner of that. Or, of or at least not an unfair competition. I see. You're not okay. undermining the sort of revenues that they would normally have received with mm -hmm. your own activities. Okay. So that's the US, and mm -hmm. the important is it's open-ended. And what we are seeing is a number of US companies have openly acknowledged their use of very large data sets, such as the Common Crawl, mm. uh, which has captured vast reams of information on the internet, which is often subject to copyright. Mm -hmm. Now, you need to contrast that with UK law. Now, in UK law, we have a closed list of what is considered fair dealing. Right. And the closest we come is what we call text and data analysis, but that's for non-commercial purposes. Mm -hmm. So, if I'm creating a generative AI model, which I'm then giving to access to the public to generate images, I'm probably not going to fall within that because it's going to be a commercial activity. Mm, I see. So the the differences between these different um, jurisdictions, US, UK, I'd be interested to dig a little bit more into that because I think a lot of people listening might be thinking, well, you know, we're, we're living in such a globalized world that you know where an AI model is based or indeed where that data has come from, can we really attribute, attribute it to a particular locality? Is it not just sort of ethereal and we, it just exists in the world? So a question I would have is, you know, when I guess we're deciding about whose law does this come under, what sort of things need to be considered? Um, you know, the stability case, is that, a, is that a US case that's being handled there? And why not a UK case, for example? Well, they've actually brought parallel ah, okay. cases. So Getty has sued stability and, and other mm -hmm. diffusion model suppliers mm -hmm. in both the US mm -hmm. uh, and the UK. And there's also a class action, a separate class action, brought by artists against stability and others uh, in the US. But ultimately, copyright is a national right, mm -hmm. but we have international treaties that require the vast majority of countries to recognize a minimum standard of copyright protection right. for people who aren't their nationals. Mm -hmm. uh, but essentially, you can sue where the copying took place. Right. So okay. a UK owner of UK copyright, if it's infringed in the US, mm -hmm. can sue in the US. I see. And when you say treaty. and when you say created, do you mean the, literally the server where that happened, or is it where the person is located who did the copying, or is that kind of all in, in the ambiguity of the uh, definition? I'm not sure there are hard and fast rules about right. any of that, mm -hmm. and I imagine it would be up to every national court to decide those parameters. Mm -hmm. But certainly in the era of the cloud, mm -hmm. uh, cross jurisdictional headaches like that have become more commonplace. Yeah. I can imagine. I mean, exactly. I mean, I think it's it's one thing, isn't it, when we're talking about somebody copying a piece of work on their own computer or on their own hardware, but then when a lot of the services that are being used now, I don't think the person using it would necessarily know, you know where that server is based or where that data has come from. Um, so, yeah, very interesting to hear that, you know, these cross country, I guess, problems are starting to rear their head more so in the AI era than ever before. Another thing that you mentioned there that I wanted to touch upon is that universities have been involved in the creation of many of these models. And as you say, the, the law and the, the rules are perhaps a little bit more lenient for where it's being built initially for research purposes under a university. And, and the data that goes into that can often be more considered to be in line with fair use. Um, do you think that there is a, has something happened there to that sort of, um, that process of creating the model and then commercializing the model that feels to people like sleight of hand. You know, whilst it is a university that mm. has created the model, now suddenly we're being you know, sold this as a product, and that there's some sort of sleight of hand going on there to say, look, 
you know, we're trying to get around these rules by making it a research project initially, but ultimately, you know, the goal of this ultimately was to be a commercial product. Right. Um, or do you think it's a, a not as kind of underhand as that? And that uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I know a lot of the primary research is being done in mm. academic institutions. The, the current cases, uh, although open source is often mentioned, which mm. is a separate thing from research, um, I'm not necessarily aware that the models per se, have literally been like for like transferred into a commercial entity. Mm -hmm. I think they are continuing to create new models for exactly. a commercial setting. So again, it's probably a grey area if I legally, by which I mean without infringing copyright, uh, train a model within an academic setting, mm -hmm. uh, can I then repurpose it uh, in a non-academic setting? I think that's going to be an issue to be to be before the courts at some point. Mm -hmm. What I would say is there is a combined issue which is both technological and legal, which people like you and me need to get together mm -hmm. and solve. Because ultimately, we need to decide what parts of the process are copies mm -hmm. and whether those copies are the sort of thing that copyright was supposed to prevent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in particular, it used to be that text and data analysis, in the main, was extracting facts, okay. mm -hmm. mere information, which isn't protectable mm -hmm. in copyright for long-standing policy reasons, but no one should be able to monopolise information itself. Mm -hmm. So if I use a copyright work to teach facial recognition, and I'm extracting 30 or 40 data points on every face mm -hmm. in a copyright work, the thing I've stored doesn't really reflect the original image. Sure, it's a representation of that. I don't think it's even a representation of the image. Mm -hmm. It's extracted data mm -hmm. from the image, which really is information. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's capturing any of the expression sure. that the artist or the photographer had chosen. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's take an even less controversial example. Let's say I have a gender identification Mm -hmm. algorithm and I extract from images whether the subjects are male or female. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we can agree that that's just a single bit. Mm -hmm. It's a data point. Yep. There's no protection in it. So mm -hmm. that kind of data mining is fine. Okay. And I can then use that data as I wish. Mm -hmm. Now the issue we're seeing is that with generative AI we are capturing expression. Mm -hmm. We're capturing the very things that copyright is supposed to protect. I see. Okay. And so here are the questions that you and I need to solve, not on this podcast, but That's good, for, yeah. for society. <laughs> but in, in due course, courts will have to face these questions. First of all, if I extract in some form of vector or other digital format information that captures the expression of an image, mm -hmm. is that a copy? Mm. Personally, I think that's, that's an easy one. Mm. It's like a JPEG. Mm. It's, if I can recreate the image mm. from that vector, mm -hmm. then it's a copy. Mm. Okay, the next question is if I train a model on those extracted vectors, mm -hmm. is the model a copy? Mm, I see. And I think some data scientists would readily say that generally a model is a compression yep. of the training data. And we have seen academic papers uh, looking at specific diffusion models which have extracted from those diffusion models exact or near exact copies of some of the training data. Mm -hmm. So there appears to be at least some degree of memorization within these models. So is the model a copy? That's the next question. And then finally the output's copies. Now I have to make clear that copyright requires two things. One that you actually had access to and copied the original. Mm -hmm. And secondly that the thing you produce is actually similar to it. Right. Or at least the bit you took is similar to the original. Now, the vast majority of the output of generative AI is not similar no. to the training data. And I, I'm very comfortable that the vast majority is not going to be a copyright infringement. Mm. But there may be some. Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, if I have lawfully extracted the training data, which I'm allowed to do under text and data mining or mm. text and data analysis in this country for non-commercial purposes, if extracted data is a copy, I still have a problem mm. moving it across a border Mm. by uh, importing that work into another mm -hmm. uh, jurisdiction or just making further copies of it. Likewise, the model, we need to figure out as a matter of technicality if we consider it a copy mm. and if that's a 
a copy for the purposes of, of the copyright act because that means once I've trained a model I may not be able to move it from country to country yeah. or make further copies I see so it's all it's all about understanding what really goes on in this black box and, and how much of it is truly seen as copying and how much of it is simply capturing a small in the example that you gave there is on gender a small amount of information about that that isn't actually copying and it seems yeah. that we've got you know the two ends of the spectrum because on the one hand these models are remarkable at producing stylistic images which are in no way copied from any one image mm -hmm. but capture the expression and the the idea within a lot of images but on the other hand you're absolutely right to say that there are very concrete examples of what can only be described as copying and changing a few pixels around and so it's remarkable that we've got a case here that the same model is doing both and it's not we can't sort of say well this model is just doing type a or just doing type b you can only really talk about the model as a whole and you can't talk about certain neurons as being the copying neurons and certain other neurons as being it's all wrapped up in this you know, neural network that is very black box at the moment um, and to be clear what yeah. will happen in litigation is that in a limited amount of time a judge who has not had to tackle these issues before mm. and may not have a technical background yep. in this field mm. um, but may be a, a, an incredibly smart biochemist mm. of, by background or, or the like will listen to the expert evidence of two experts who will agree on the majority of the technology but mm. not on the key questions of nuance mm. and will have to decide the law on that basis yeah, yeah. So, um, and set precedent for cases down the line mm. indeed so you mentioned earlier the idea that it really matters if there's a competition with the um, the data that has been trained on. So you, you mentioned the example of you crawling the web and if you're simply surfacing those results and in many ways that might actually benefit the websites that have been crawled, then, then that might be okay. But in other cases, if you're providing direct competition and it's eating into the business of that, that website, then that's obviously a different matter. And I think most people would say, Generative AI is, is an indirect competition with many of the images on which it has been trained and actually has the potential to eat into artists' revenue, has the potential to eat into the revenue of, um, of stock image websites, for example, that have been crawled. So do you think that is also coming into the play here, the fact that this is, a, is clearly a technology that is in competition in some way with the images on which it, it, it has been trained? It's not simply surfacing them in a way that, that has the potential to increase the revenue of a, 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 a website that's delivering stop imagery, for example. So it's inherent in the current litigation mm. because the defences, to the extent they rely on text and data mining or fair use, those require that you've passed the threshold for fairness. Yep. Mm -hmm. So even if you fell within all the other requirements, mm. you still need to ask if what you did was fair. Was fair, right. And I, I think it would be a relatively hard case to say that where I've trained it on the work of literally millions of artists, mm. that an image which is not a particular copy mm. of anything within the artwork of a particular artist is unfair. Mm -hmm. But where there is... Um, widespread copying of the work of a particular artist, mm. the court might mm. think that isn't fair. And I'll give you an example. Uh, there is a fantasy artist uh, called um, Greg Rutowski, Rutowski, I think. Mm. Um, and the last time I checked, which was around the beginning of 2022, his name had been used in over 93,000 facts <laughs> on, on Midgen. So, wow. yeah. I think he is facing arguably some unfair mm. uh, practices here. Mm. Maybe not per se by the diffusion model, but in aggregate by all these users and the fact that no measures have been taken to prevent users mm -hmm. putting in his name. Mm. And that brings us on to the mitigations of whether guardrails can be used to keep a, a model fair. Sure, yeah. And in some uh, suppliers um, believe that they've trained it only on work under license mm -hmm. in a way that has ensured that they won't infringe people's rights. And others have trained their models on substantially everything, mm. but have tried to build in safeguards into the way prompts are processed so yeah. you can't call up a copyright work. Mm -hmm or a trademark mm. or the like and indeed um, another thing slightly adjacent to copyright are personality rights mm. so I think some of the most 
challenging examples at the moment are the emulation of people's voices uh, and musical styles. Again, issues of fairness there, I would say. Mm. Um, but actually very limited rights, at least in this country. So in this country, personality rights really don't extend beyond a celebrity uh, being able to take action where someone has mm -hmm. misled the public into mm -hmm. thinking that they've endorsed their product. I see, yeah. But in other countries, in particular states, in America you have personality rights in your likeness and voice, mm -hmm. uh, you also have principles of unfair competition uh, in various jurisdictions, and in some jurisdictions you even have human rights or constitutional rights mm -hmm. in your voice or likeness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting to, to touch upon because I think it, it comes back to, you know, this is cross um, modality, we're not talking about images, but like you rightly pointed out, music as well. And we've seen recently two very different and contrasting viewpoints being put out by artists. You have um, you know, uh, Drake on the one hand who's saying, look, this is, this is a, a complete infringement of everything I've built and mm -hmm. as my artistry. And then um, Grimes who's on the other hand saying, actually, this is a new business model for me. And I, I find that I find that this is only going to, you know, in the future become more of a, an issue for artists. And I think they will have to decide which camp they belong to. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, can sure. Actually, yeah. Can I reflect on that? Of course, yeah. You say they have to decide which camp they're in, and that actually goes to a fundamental question about what the solution is. Mm -hmm. Because if we go down the exception route, so I can train on anything, mm -hmm. um, provided you haven't opted out, it's a sort of yes-no situation. Yeah. If we go down a licensing route, mm -hmm. then people can say, I'll license you for these purposes. Yes. And it doesn't have to be a stark choice between Drake and Grimes. Mm. It can be, I'm licensing you to do it for mm. these mm -hmm. things and not these things. Yeah. So we shall see how the law develops mm. and if rights holders retain some choice mm. over how things are used. The other thing I would say is when it comes to a celebrity like Drake, um, it is entirely possible that he owns the copyright mm -hmm. in all of the recordings that would have been required oh, I see. to yeah. emulate mm -hmm. his voice and mm -hmm. to learn his writing style and, like, and he might have a copyright mm -hmm. action as well as a personality right action. Mm -hmm. So this comes back to the idea that there's a, there's these two sides of the equation, isn't there? There's the, you know, have you done something with my data that I own the copyright for that I'm not happy with? And that's very separate from the issue of what comes out and whether mm. there's, a, you know, you might have a different opinion about whether this is something you actually want to build into your business model as an artist. Um, so, and, and interesting, you mentioned licensing. That's also the view of Luba Elliott, who we talked to a few weeks ago. She's an art curator. Mm -hmm. And um, we've also you know, spoken on this po podcast to blockchain experts who are, who are saying, look, this is a perfect use case for our technology because we can start to potentially build in um, an authorship lineage that the sort of in, is able in some way to trace back what this model is trained on and, and yep. be able to attribute to particular artists a particular licensing fee. No matter how, how small, in some cases, we might be talking about you know, you know very, very small amounts, but ultimately this is because the model is trained on millions and millions of images and it's in some way able to, to detect that this is uh, a small part of what has come out of this output. Um, so I think that's that's a really fascinating area for development. I mean, your background as well is, is in part, as a, correct me if I'm wrong, but also with blockchain technology um, and the implication of this. I've certainly looked at blockchain a lot. I've mm -hmm. advised on the licensing, uh, the IP in, in blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, I am quite openly a bit of a skeptic yep. about 99% of the uses of blockchain, mm -hmm. because unless there is a genuine issue where you're dealing with so many people and you can't guarantee trust, Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't think it has an application. Yeah. So where there is a, where <laughs> the number of times I hear a blockchain application as between two people, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which makes yeah. no sense. No, um, I'm sure. But uh, you're absolutely right that there are various, um, there's various work going on about provenance. Mm. Part of it is about avoiding, or rather proving that an image has been manipulated mm -hmm. in terms of journalistic accuracy and mm -hmm. to, to fight deep fakes. Part of it is about trying to enable artists to see if their work has been used. Mm -hmm. Now you're the technical expert uh, and you will have a better sense of whether 
once it's gone through data extraction through a model, whether there's much real likelihood mm. of proving the source uh, of yeah, <laughs> of how can we trace back to it? Uh, mm. And as a as a lawyer to build a case, I'm looking for evidence. Mm. Now, the academic papers which have shown what uh, seem to be like for like regurgitation mm. of an image. In those scenarios, you would typically have a reversal of the burden of proof. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't have to prove mm. that you had used my image because I got my image out. Right, I see. And you would yeah. need to come up with How some explanation mm. but for copying. Mm. Um, so, but where it is a more nuanced issue, uh, I think there may be, it may be, the technology can be added now to mm. images that will help track uh, that use well uh, maybe not look yeah absolutely and, and you know for our listeners um, you know what Matt's referring to there I guess is the overfitting of a model to a particular element of that data set and certainly I think when these models were created there was a there was not much understanding that that's what they were doing and I think people were so amazed by the 99.9% .9 of other images coming out that in many ways they forgot to look for these cases that are and I, and I think there's a lot of clever prompting that's gone into actually creating and finding specific examples and, and sort of almost bounty hunting, if you like, for these images, because that in itself is almost becoming a bit of an industry to say, well, look, I, you've got a case here against this um, this company because I've just found your image. If you type this prompt in with you know zero temperature, you're going to get out exactly this image that I know is yours and copyrighted. Um, do you think partly the data that's being I mean, the data that's been trained on for a lot of the open source models is is you know by definition open and, and likes of stability have said look this is what we've trained on but sorry can, yeah sure can I just make sure I understand yeah. open source data open source models what were you talking about yeah sorry I was talking about open source but my point I was yeah. going to come to was around um, the fact that I find it interesting that open AI oh, sorry stability AI is one of the companies that is often the 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 defendant on a lot of these cases mm -hmm. and I think. I was going to ask, correct me if I'm wrong, but is, is it whether the fact that they are a little bit more open about what they're doing means that they're actually more open to yeah. attack? Because yeah. OpenAI, we don't know what they're training on. Um, so yeah, I'll, 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 yeah. I'll rephrase okay. it because you're, you're absolutely right to say there's a differentiation there. Yeah. Maybe I'll point that out the yeah. question as well. So one of the things that I have been thinking about recently is, is the reason why Stability AI is often the defendant in a lot of these cases is the fact that they are a bit more open about what they're doing and by definition their model is open source and there's perhaps a, a differentiation there between open source modeling and open source data in comparison to say open ai which sort of counterintuitively are a lot more closed about what their model is and what they have trained on so actually it's harder for people to bring a case against them because they don't know if their image is in that data set whereas at least in some ways it, with with models trained on open data you can say that's my image and that's why i'm suing you I don't know if you could give us a few thoughts around that. Absolutely. I'll pick up on the last thing you said, which mm. is open data. Mm. I, I think you have to be careful about that sort of terminology. So, sure. you know, we are talking in the main about copyright images. Mm. There are data sets which are sometimes described as open source data sets, but they're collections of copyright images. Sure, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and works. So, uh, although the, the people who've arranged it, as far as they're concerned, you can use it mm. within certain obligations. Mm. It doesn't come free of all the copyright that, that applies mm -hmm. uh, to, to the works inside it. Now, turning to your question, I've certainly read a lot of commentary that the stability became a target because uh, it was a matter of public knowledge that they had taken, let's say, 12 million images from Adobe mm -hmm. and however many images from, from Getty. And yes, I, I would imagine that that played mm. a factor. Um, I think uh, Getty also, um, and I don't know if this is only because they knew to look, mm. but they've also been able to show you that something akin to their walk watermark comes out sometimes. So right. again, yeah. in that respect, a bit of a smoking gun about you. So mm. I'm, I'm not saying anything about whether it's copyright infringement, but, mm -hmm. but, but a bit of a smoking gun, their images were used. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I do think a company's level of openness mm. is going to have an impact on whether they become a target. Sure. And on that, um, I've got to point out that the latest version of the AI Act, mm. so this is the EU's regulation mm. for AI, which wasn't written 
to address generative AI, but has been amended in the light of generative AI. It has uh, currently in draft, but it has a requirement that before you market a generative AI mm-hmm. in, in Europe, or you put it into service, which includes your own mm-hmm. use, mm-hmm. and use in anger, not, not use in R&D, but before you do that, you need to have documented and made public some sort of statement as to the copyright works mm. it was trained on. So everyone, mm. if that law applies, will end up in the situation of stability, indicating to the world what they've used. Yeah, and if they're using you know, off-the-shelf closed source models, I guess you would describe them, trained on data that is, is not really known, then does that put them at risk as well as a business? It, would, would a business using, perhaps this comes to uh, you know, our, our later topic there that we mentioned, which is the, the other side of the equation, the usage of images created by AI, it, are they also at risk of you know, legal action, I guess, if they're using images that have come out of something like an open AI model, um, where it's not clear what that has been trained upon? Um, Okay, so we're using open in, in, a, yeah, in at least two a, different ways. I should open so, with a so, capital O. So, so open AI. What, you're distinguishing open and open source models, where yes. you're, you're yeah. allowed to pick them up and do something with them, which, and there are still obligations mm-hmm. and restrictions in open source, which you have to check to mm-hmm. make sure it's appropriate. The other issue is whether the person who's made the model has been publicly transparent mm. about what they used mm. and, and those are two considerations so I again this is all untested law and, and, and a real issue but I, it is clear that there are now a number of companies some household name companies in terms of the arts mm. um, who are hoping that by having a model which they can show has been trained to the best of their abilities on licensed material, mm-hmm. it will be a no-brainer yeah. for corporates to go to them just to cut out that sure. risk. Yeah, yeah. Um, that said, if I'm using via an API someone's model, and I returning to our earlier conversation about whether the training data is a copy, whether the model is a copy, mm-hmm. if I'm not making a copy of their model mm-hmm. or training data, it's behind the wall mm-hmm. as far as I'm concerned. I'm just pressing a button, getting images out. If those images aren't in them, aren't in themselves copies. If those images, the ones I get, I don't think I'm liable for what was happening behind the wall. Sure. Yeah, and this gets to the heart of the matter, doesn't it? I think with regards to where businesses should sort of see the risk, and uh, you know, there's a, we were at a conference just yesterday together, and I think there was a lot of questions in the room around. You know, do I need to be concerned as a person who runs a business that just simply wants to use what is available today in terms of technology? How much do I need to worry about these these action you know, lawsuit, class action lawsuits that are going on with regards to how I use the data? I mean, am I also at risk as a business? And it's interesting there that you, you say, you know, what goes on behind the wall mm-hmm. really is is you know not their concern, and they should be they should feel that they are able to use these models, but perhaps from an ethical perspective. They might want to, yeah. as a business, align themselves to a model that's been trained on, on yeah. licensed images, yeah. for example. Uh, licensed images. And the other thing is, even if it's behind the wall and you're generating images, I would still say you ought to have some sort of um, procedure to check if the images you've got out are copyrighted. Right. Mm. I mean, but this has always been a problem. Mm. If I have my own designers and artists, right. you know, I need to give them training that they really mustn't mm. copy other people's work. Yeah, and it true. does happen in big companies. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a cost of business and something you have to deal with. Yeah. But um, actually, one, one of the guests at, at yesterday's conference was suggesting that as a minimum, you could put the image you're about to use mm-hmm. through Google and just mm. see if anything comes up. Sure, yeah. So, that, okay, there are mitigation strategies yeah. then. And, and like you say, there, these are questions that businesses will have faced before. It's not a new territory completely, but I suppose the velocity and the um, the fact that this is a not a human producing it, so there's not other human thoughts going on at the, the point of production. And I can't it, you know, chat to the model. And sure, say. exactly. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> not yet. Um, so I want to move now to the other side of the equation, which is the actual thing that's produced by the AI model, whether that's text or images or music, whatever it might be. In terms of ownership, who owns that piece of content? Okay, so generally speaking, most of what a human would produce 
potentially falls under copyright. Mm-hmm. Not everything, um, but certainly literary works fall under copyright, artistic works fall under copyright, musical, dramatic, there are other categories. So as long as it's in one of those categories, that, that's the first question, would it fall within one of those categories? The second issue is, did I use the AI merely as a tool for my creativity? Mm-hmm. So if I use Photoshop, at the moment, there's no real doubt that as an artist using Photoshop, I, I mm-hmm. was still the artist because I was controlling its direction of travel. I was making creative choices for it, which were expressed in the final work. Mm-hmm. Now, where I'm only putting in a text prompt, am I still only using it as a tool? Mm-hmm. Is this in fact my creativity? And that is an emerging field. There is a little bit of case law in the UK, old case law, where people have given detailed verbal instructions and they owned or part owned copyright mm. in the resulting artistic work. Really? So right. it's, it's directly on point. Mm. Yeah. But the fact that generative AI allows me to do two things one is to put in a, like one word and, and get an image. Yeah. Mm. Maybe I haven't really guided it at all. Mm. The other thing is from bitter personal experience. I know exactly what I wanted to do and I can't get it to do it. <laughs> there is a certain art to it. Yeah. And, and so yeah. is it, is the resulting image when it wasn't what I wanted, in fact my artistic uh, right. yeah. creativity, right? Mm. Now, if it's not my artistic creativity, mm. and I should just point out as well actually that the US Copyright Office has put out guidance in the light of a mm. very celebrated case. This is um, Zara. Ah, yes. Dawn. Yeah. Um, they, they've rejected human copyright in the artworks mm. and they've put out guidance saying that generally... In the artwork specifically? In the artwork. Right. Um, the artist may have degrees of copyright in the, certainly the words mm. and the comp- choice of the composition of the panels sure. of the pages and okay. things like that. But in the actual images, I believe they don't have any copyright. Mm-hmm. And the Copyright Office has essentially said a prompt is not enough. Mm. for the purposes of US law. Right. Now, UK, and actually a handful of other jurisdictions, and I'm literally talking five to six, Mm -hmm. um, there is copyright in a computer-generated work, and that is by definition one without a human author. Mm. So that is where my prompt did not make me an artist, Mm -hmm. did not do enough. There, it's still a copyright work. So mm. in the UK, the output of a computer, of, a, of an image or text, is a copyright work. And the wrinkle is, one, it will only last 50 years, not life plus 70. And the other thing is, by default, there has to be a rule about who's going to own it. Mm. Right? By default, it's the person making the arrangements. Right. Which happens to be the same test for photos. Okay, I see. Um, because again, a photo is an image made by a machine, but mm. you had to have decide... You made the arrangement to do yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But there's going to be huge amounts of debate about who that is. Mm. Is it the person who did the prompt? Is it the person who set up the API? Is it the person who built the model? You know, you can see different arguments yeah, for who made sure. the arrangements. But you can avoid all of that by having a contract mm. that says, indeed, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. And We're deciding between us who's going to own this, regardless of the default position in law. Yeah. And indeed, if you look at the terms and conditions of these uh, services, mm. they tend to say, oh, we don't have any rights, but yeah. to the extent there are, dot, 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 and then they make a choice. They either say, we own it and we license it to you, mm. or you own it and you license it back to us, or mm. you own it and we don't. It depends on the service. And I, something that sort of springs to mind, I suppose, is, is would you need to declare how the image has been produced then, the actual production method itself, say whether it's mid-journey or... Right. You know, I mean, why is there any incentive to do that? Why couldn't you say, I, I'm just not going to say? What okay. was the... So copyright, copyright arises automatically. Uh, and under international treaty, you can't put restrictions on it. But as, as to your own nationals, you can put restrictions on. And the way it works in some countries is to have certain advantages, you have to register your copyright. Mm. You still get a basic level of copyright anyway. So in the States, what they've said is if you do use AI, you do need to disclose it and you do need to explain what you did. You have to, really. If, in order to register Oh, in order to register it. To get the benefits of registration. Yeah. And we shall see mm. whether people are given copyright, what sort of descriptions are accepted as having given them mm. copyright or not. Um, the other rumblings 
of certainly in the EU and certainly in the UK and I think in the States there's a lot of talk about some sort of legal requirement to reveal the use of AI. Mm. A lot of that's about deep fakes mm-hmm. sure. and fraud, um, but it might well extend to art in general and text in general. So we may well see some sort of legal requirement. Mm. Um, and I know that, again, Adobe, for example, is already piloting uh, an extension to Photoshop, mm. which will label um, parts which are generated in their Firefly as uh, generated by AI in the metadata. Right, and I suppose it's such a grey area, isn't it? Because you, like you rightly pointed out, it's not often the case of just putting in a prompt and that image is the thing that will end up being copyrighted. There's often it's just part of a process. And then we saw talks yesterday from architects, for example, who were using this as a tool just to get started with a concept yeah. or indeed to build on something that was their original creation, a sketch or a, yeah. um, an, ink, an ink drawing. And then ultimately, yes, there's a, a piece of art that comes out of something like Mid Journey, but then that's pushed to a 3D model. Yeah. And then it, you know, so it is an incredibly grey area, right? It's, it sounds yeah. like, and, and whether it, in some cases, it is just viewed as a tool um, and part of the creative process of an individual, or in some cases, it actually, it's really important to know that this was the thing that ultimately generated the thing that's trying to be copyrighted, and there's no yeah. steps after this. Yeah, and, and you know, what, what steps would take it out? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's a very interesting uh, video I watched of an artist who starts with a sketch for his own purposes of the composition he wants mm. and in order to get an image corresponding to that it takes about 15 hours mm-hmm. of work yeah so there's out the and in painting yeah. and photoshop and the like yeah. whereas i think a lot of people put in a prompt mm-hmm. and, and accept yeah broadly exactly. yeah. what it produced um, but yeah, I, I totally agree that any requirement to disclose that an image is AI generated is open to immediate arguments about what the threshold is. Mm. And um, indeed brings back the question of what AI is as well. Yeah, and what has to be presented, I guess, is the, the idea that you could just generate millions of images at, uh, just by very simple prompts, take them exactly as is and claim copyright over every single one of those. And almost farm. Could you could you could you view a, a, a future where you sort of farm, you know, so, farm that sort of thing? So the mm-hmm. the issue with that, and, and that's the sort of thing one does here, is copyright is not a monopoly. Mm. I can't monopolize music. I can't monopolize art by by churning out a load of images. It's only actionable if someone then copies it. Right, okay. Mm. So if I happen to anticipate someone else's work and they've never seen the thing I mm. churned out, mm. I've got no action against them. Right, okay. So it has to be something copied and you have to show that that person knowingly had access to that piece of art and, and, and took a direct copy. Or, or It reminds me also of um, the case, the Warhol case, which I'm sure you're familiar mm. with as well. Of, I mean, his whole, his whole genre, I guess, was appropriation and taking someone else's... Um, mm in some cases licensed art and then using it in a way that is novel and transformative like you say. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see any parallels with other examples from the art world and previous cases and, and existing cases of you know, artists that have been taken to the courts because they have done something with a piece of uh, license or copyrighted work um, that you know, has been seen to not be transformative enough or seen to in some way infringe upon that copyright. Um, it, do you think there's learnings from the art world and previous cases that could be taken forward into the AI art world or, or do you see them as totally different? So I'm not a US lawyer, mm. um, so I don't know the ins and outs. And, and as it happens, I'm not qualified even to you know, talk about it as a lawyer. But my impression mm. um, is that these cases are all US cases, particularly right. the term transformative use is a US concept okay. right? and it's just a form of a fair use there. And this is very topical because a colleague of mine texted me earlier mm. that literally today uh, the US at first instance has decided Warhol's use of photography of prints uh, was not transformative oh, use. So everyone's been waiting for this wow. outcome yeah. and anything that erodes the extent of fair use is going to be a concern mm. to people working with generative AI because that has been the basis I would say for a lot of the training mm. that's been going on, on on copyright works. Now they are actually separate issues and it will 
as I said, one of the issues is whether it was fair. You know, so there'll be everything, as, as, as lawyers say, will be fact dependent. Mm. So the fact that the Warhol case has come out one way won't necessarily mean something in right. terms of AI. Yeah. But it certainly will be somewhat unsettling. But mm. the court might be. To, a lot of the things work as a pendulum. Mm. You know, the courts move one way and then they. There seems to be a tipping point and they start to move back. All right. So it's possible that in the States, transformatory use will begin to get trimmed. Mm-hmm. So no one of these cases is going to you know, be the, the case that decides everything. Every case will, will in its own right have the ability to sway the courts one way or the other and that you know will form part of the landscape. So if, if a judge clarifies the law in some significant way, mm. it can change commercial practice overnight. Mm. Mm. Um, the cases that go to court are by definition those without a clear answer mm. which are only a subset of, of what, what goes on in the world yeah. Um, so yeah if, if a court case if, if the stability court case gives some clear general principles as to the use of training data it could change the industry Yeah, but I think the last thing I'd, I'd want to touch on briefly is just um, looking to the future and yeah. just you know where are we going to be in ten years with this? I think it's probably the or five. Let's 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 cap it. Maybe <laughs> it doesn't matter. Five weeks. I yeah, five weeks. Really yeah, that's true. So yeah. don't, don't worry about the threshold. Um, okay, so I'll I'll say sort of you know short term what's on your mind, maybe immediate term and long term. I mean, you could ask me what I think the law should be, and I will tell you. Okay, but that's that's a social question. Mm. Okay, which I, which I so I won't give you an answer, mm. but I think it's a good I, question though. I think it, yeah. no, but I also think. <laughs> It's important yeah. that we have stakeholders working with government on this. Okay, right, let's start with that one. Yeah. Okay, so Matt, the big question perhaps that's on everybody's lips listening to this. In your opinion, what should the law be around this? I mean, we've talked a lot about you know, what is happening and what might happen, but in your opinion, you know, where should the law come from? What, what should this be and who should drive it? Sure, so the UK government has been consulting on a few factors here. So one is inventions uh, by AI, which I think is very important to the life sciences sector. Uh, they decided they couldn't go it alone, which is absolutely right, and that they would pursue an international uh, reform. But that will take a long time. Hmm. Second was computer-generated works. We are an outlier. As I said, we're one of only six jurisdictions with protection. Uh, and they decided it wasn't doing any harm, they'd leave hmm. it alone and then revisit it. And the third was text and data mining, which I think is incredibly significant about what activities will take place in this jurisdiction and in other jurisdictions, and we are out of step Mm. uh, with Europe and the US, although the US may be in in flux. But fundamentally, I advise people um, with a spectrum of of positions, and so you know, maybe a publisher who wants to uh, assert copyright, it may be a tech company who mm. wants to use copyright material. But more fundamentally than that, this isn't a legal question. So what the law should be isn't for lawyers to mm. decide, particularly in an area where we are looking at social change, mm. we're looking at our values as a society of art and human dignity and human autonomy. Mm. And the only right way in a democracy for these laws to be developed is through consultation with mm. stakeholders. And that requires actually not merely people with lobbyists and clear positions, but the general public needs to be educated and brought into the, to the frame. And you and I know how small the pool of experts is mm. uh, in this area. And then it needs to work through a democratic process to balance the interests of society mm to reach some sort of social contract. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a question for lawyers, but we will tell you how to do it efficiently. It's not a question for economists, Mm -hmm. but they will hopefully be able to put some numbers on it for Mm -hmm. us. It is a social question. Do you worry that the technological pace of change will outstrip society's ability to understand it as quickly as it's progressing? Because I think, you know, we can all perhaps imagine a world where we understand and, and, and become comfortable with a certain form of generative AI and a certain form of, um, as you say, social contract with how we deal with it, but then the technology will change again and now new things are possible. And, and I, I just wonder, can the, can the law and the courts keep up with the, the pace of change? Well, I'll give you an example. Um, in IP law, which is obviously my, my favourite examples, so the video 
cassette, the VHS cassette, you mm-hmm. know, Betamax VHS, they were put on the market. We would all record broadcast TV to watch later. But it took the UK Parliament 13 years, 13 years huh? to, to actually put an exception into copyright law to make yeah. what everyone was doing legal. <laughs> Um, and I think even in the relatively short period of time, the two or three years that the EU has been really focusing on regulation, the technology has moved so fast mm-hmm. that they've had to adjust fundamental issues of scope mm-hmm. of the AI Act uh, to handle generative AI and foundation models. So uh, it is inevitable with any new technology that legislation uh, falls behind, but particularly where it is as fast moving as this field, and also where there could be so much debate mm. about what the right answers are. Mm. Um, another thing that just crossed my mind there, if, if you were advising anyone looking to get into IP law as a profession, and particularly with an AI mm. slant, um, are, are there any resources or pieces of advice that you would give them as to how to how to upskill their own knowledge of the area, but also how to sort of keep an open mind to the different you know, viewpoints. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, I think uh, <laughs> I think you'd be welcome with open arms if you <laughs> if, if you had a technical background yeah, uh, sure. and you wanted to enter the law. I mean, we aren't necessarily in the first pecking order. So generally, if you're an expert on the technology, you're going into big tech or finance mm-hmm. or, or the like. There are, in my field, patent attorneys, these are the people who write patent applications mm-hmm. and get, get you your patent. They tend to hoover up the genuine technical experts, mm-hmm. the engineers, the data scientists and the like, to the extent they want to have a legal career. And then you have uh, solicitors, um, and we have lots of biochemists, mm-hmm. very few physicists, you know, computer engineers generally. Um, and so it's really a question of someone who's willing to sit down with a book like yours and read it as a, as a, as a lawyer and read it again until they understand it. Uh, and I would say in IP, that's what we do for every new case. We have to learn a whole new technical area. Mm. Uh, so we just have to have that mindset and, and to enjoy it, to be a technophile mm. and, and you know, to read these things for pleasure as well as for yeah. work. Um, so yeah, it's if you love this, technology um, and you want to be a lawyer you got to pursue both there you go so you heard it here first if you're a technological person and you've got this interest in what's going on in the ethical side and the legal side there's roots for you into the profession now oh, you're welcome yes. with with open arms um, my last question to you Matt it's been fantastic talking to you I've learned so much uh, through this chat I have to say my last question to you is just a look to the future we always ask all of our guests if they're optimistic pessimistic um, if they have fears about what they're seeing at the moment or whether actually they think that this is going to do a huge amount of, of good for society. Could you just give us your maybe short, medium term, long view from a, a legal perspective as to where you think we're heading? Hmm. Well, I mean, the real issue of the law is it's just going to move too slowly. I'm mm-hmm. sorry. Uh, that, that is definitely the issue. I do worry that the law is often, in this field in particular, they start to regulate AI and then AI becomes relevant to absolutely every part of society and then they, if they don't think clearly, they end up trying to regulate society. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think you know we can lose sight of that that we have lots of laws to cover lots of things already, so fraud and, and the like. But we already have laws and discrimination. It doesn't really matter if I'm doing it by AI or, mm-hmm. or otherwise. So if your question is restricted to law, <laughs> I, I mean, it's great news. For professionals like me, sure, you know, yeah. it's raising a huge uh, gamut of new issues, mm-hmm. um, and I think people who have uh, a technical interest and understanding and have looked at the law, you know, will have lots of work to do, which is fantastic. But I think it, there is very little legal certainty at the moment. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's great for society no. or, or business. If if you want my view on the technology in general, mm-hmm. um, and I know we have at one end. You know existential risks, and at the other end, a third AI winter where mm. we all decide it was all hype and actually, although it did funny things on mm. social media, it didn't really change business. Um, I'm interested to see the number of really quite prosaic applications that people are now proposing, mm. and we might see some serious cost savings and the mm. like. 
the biggest debate is whether it's so called 10x is us and we sure. all become mm. superhumans of productivity or if it displaces jobs. Mm. Um, my own view with the with the historical precedence is you know we've had absolutely cataclysmic changes through the industrial revolution, and electricity and the internet and the like. And we tend to find new things to do. Right. There's temporary displacement, but people find new things to do. And I would also say um, that my experience, both in the law and in other fields, is when the price of something falls, so let's say the price of imagery, mm. people just use more of it. Mm. Mm. Um, and they expect it to be bespoke, mm. or they expect to have more choices. Mm. And so I suspect it will just generate more human creativity yeah. in the long run. I, I'm in complete agreement. I mean, we heard yesterday from you know architects who were saying that they simply can't find enough architects at the moment in the yeah. country that they're based, and that it's extremely, extremely wonderful that they can now use these tools to, in some regards, 10x, like you say, what they're doing, and they're not finding that they're under threat. But actually, this is something that those who are using the tools are just you know light years ahead of anyone who isn't and I think we'll start to see that across other industries but like you say as well that we need to move beyond the prosaic uh, applications to something that really is you know societal changing and it's not it's not just a case of producing you know funnier things on social media but ultimately where are the huge applications and what are the big fundamental changes that we'll be seeing um, so look Matt it's been brilliant talking to you I, I'm sure our listeners have really appreciated the clarity that you've brought to this situation today because I think it's a murky it's murky waters at the moment and it's a jungle that we're all trying to chop our way through but certainly this conversation's helped certainly me to understand the, the field a bit better so thank you very much my pleasure thank you